welcome everyone to the Truth and Justice Vigil. We've been gathering since April when the trial for uh, Derek Chauvin began um, and really met to come together to be in support of one another as we are all deeply impacted by the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent uprising and this uh, deep demand for justice and the truth of racial profiling and violence against black bodies. And so we've been gathering every Tuesday since through the verdict, through the sentencing as um, those landmark decisions, unfortunately, uh, did not result in a massive systems change. We still have a, a real problem here in the United States. And I think each of us in our own way uh, grapple with how, as Buddhist practitioners especially, and how we show up with this commitment to kindness and peace when um, the injustice leads to, at least for myself, such great outrage. And so we've been fortunate to have a host of wise uh, Dharma teachers of African descent who hold space with us here each Tuesday, offering their lived experience, their uh, perspective, and great wisdom. And today is no different. We are blessed with the presence of Tweri Salah. She is the guiding teacher at Seattle Insight. Uh, and uh, Tweri has, uh, this is Tweri's return to Common Ground. Her first visit, I think it was 2019, and she led a program in person. Was it 2019, maybe 2018? Something like that. Uh, and so this is her return, not her debut, her return. Um, and she brings just this rich uh, lived experience um, where and models such great wisdom and resiliency um, and a practice grounded in, I love this mudita. She uh, has loved to laugh and find the joy in all situations and experiences. So with that, I introduce you all to the great Tuwari Salah. Welcome, <laughs> Tuwari. <laughs> <laughs> the great. <laughs> oh my God, that's that's great. That's the way you want to be introduced. <laughs> great. Oh, Angela, that's my wifey right there. <laughs> Um, I am so happy to be here. I really am, but I'm going to go right over there and get a, a book because I just realized the poem I wanted to start with. So I'm not just running out. <laughs> I have to get this poem because uh, I just, I've been, I've been trying to think of what kind of poem did I want to read about where we are to start us out with. And um, it's this poem right here. It's this poem. Probably one of the best poems ever, I think. So first, let me start by saying, I really, it really, really is an honor to be here. And it's an honor because I have not been holding this vigil. I, you know, I, my Tuesday evenings, I've been doing all kinds of things, but uh, you have been holding this vigil. And there's something about having the courage to hold something difficult for others. We don't always give that level of respect, but uh, I do recognize what you're doing here by holding the difficulty of someone else. And I, I'm, and I mean, holding the difficulty on behalf of someone else, people you don't even know, people you're not even connected to, but what you're doing is holding uh, like George Floyd's legacy and the legacy of all these people who have died on behalf of people who don't even know that you're holding it. And that is a big deal. So I'm hoping that our time together 
is of the same caliber and value that I feel just being able to be here with you like this. So this is the poem I'd like to start us. Let me just tell you how I'd hope we'd go. We'll have a little sit. I hope you don't mind me doing some guidance to help us get grounded because sometimes I think when you are the holder and the keeper of difficulty, you need someone to come in and help you hold that difficulty. So that's what I see my, my job as tonight is to help you uh, replenish and, and regather your faith so that you can continue this process of holding. Um, so I thought I would do some meditation here, do a little grounding and we'll have a sit. And then, um, um, is my voice okay? The, the, uh, you can hear just fine, everything's good. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure I didn't have to get my mic out. But, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what I thought I would talk about tonight. So, um, um, and, and my encouragement to you. And then um, we'll have some time to just talk about what's up for you. But I, I think what I wanna talk about, before I talk about what I wanna talk about, I also wanna ask if there's anything that's up for people so that I can kind of incorporate whatever it is that's really up for you in what, what I wanna talk about. Kind of hit on some of the points. So right after we finish this sit, I'll, I'm assuming we don't take a break since it's only an hour and a half and you can just take care of your needs as you want. Um, so right after the sit, I will give you an opportunity if anything has, if anybody has anything that's alive for them, we'll just incorporate that in the talk, all right? So the, the thing that, I, the poem I wanna read, let me turn this phone on. The poem I wanna read is from Joy Harjo. She is one of our uh, indigenous poet laureates. And the poem I'm reading is called Grace. She wrote it for someone named Darlene Wynn and someone named James Welch. So she wrote this poem for the two of them. Uh, I think, I think she wrote it in 1951. But this is what she says. I think of wind and her wild ways, the year we had nothing to lose and lost it anyway in the cursed country of the fox. We still talk about that winter, how the cold froze imaginary buffalo on the stuffed horizon of snowbanks. The haunting voices of the starved and mutilated broken fences crashed our thermostat drains. And we couldn't stand it one more time. So once again, we lost a winter in stubborn memory. Walk through cheap apartment walls skated through fields of ghosts in a town that never wanted us in the epic search for grace. Like coyote, like rabbit, we could not contain our terror and clowned our way through a season of false midnights. We had to swallow that town with laughter so it would go down as easy as honey. And one morning, as the sun struggled to break ice and our dreams had found us with coffee and pancakes in a truck stop along Highway 80, we found Grace. I could say Grace was a woman with time on her hands or a white buffalo escaped from memory. But in that dingy light, it was a promise of balance we once again understood the talk of animals and spring was lean and hungry with the hope of children and corn. I would like to say with grace, we picked ourselves up and walked into that spring thaw. We didn't. The next season was worse. You went home to Leech Lake to work with the tribe and I went south and wind 
I am still crazy. I know there is something larger than the memory of a dispossessed people. We have seen it. That's her poem. That's it. I think this is probably, it always brings me to tears. It's probably the most beautiful poem I've ever read. There's something about her knowing through all of it, nothing changes and yet we have seen grace. And there's something about the knowing of that that keeps us on the path, keeps us steady with whatever we have to deal with. So we'll sit a little bit here and then I'll read it again after we've sat a bit. I think uh, the best way to sit is to arrive in the moment and just notice where you are. You can do that by noticing the temperature, you're hot, there's coolness. You can notice the sounds, my voice, the sounds where you're at, just ambient sounds that come and go. You can notice your posture, that you're sitting or lying down. It's just taking a moment to turn your attention to noticing this present moment. I hear an airplane overhead. They fly overhead all the time, but every once in a while when I stop and just listen, then I can actually hear the airplanes. You just let them come and go. You let sound come and go. You let my words come and go. You can notice that your body is still, relatively still. Your feet are not moving. Your legs are not moving, your hands. Just sitting here, lying here, steady. Maybe feel how heavy the body is. Even with flesh and skin, as heavy as it is, Still feel the softness. It's heavy, soft, and the bones. You feel the hardness of bone, feet on the floor, the sit bones in the chair, maybe your finger bone, your arm bones, your leg bones. can feel the hardness of bone, and the heaviness of weight, even with the softness of skin and flesh. That's because this is earth. This is the felt sense of earth. It's steady, it's heavy, it's hard. We can let ourselves just feel that weightedness. The groundedness of just sitting here, just lying here, doing nothing. Just be still. You could pay attention to things you were doing before the sit or 
things you're going to do afterwards, but you don't have to. You could just sit here and give yourself a moment of noticing stillness. might notice in the stillness of the body's non-movement. You might notice the breath is moving the body gently in and out. You might notice sensations, tingling in the body, blood rushing, nerves moving. You might notice sounds moving. I can feel the sweat on my face dripping. The thoughts. So here we are. We're sitting still. There's no movement. And I can also notice that there is movement. Sound. Breathing. Tingling. Energy moving in the body. Sensations. Thoughts are moving. So in this moment, old or real movement and stillness. You can try feeling into the movement and see what that's like. If I just feel the movement of breath or just notice sound or just notice the thinking, you could rest back into the stillness of your feet are not moving, your legs are not moving, your body is stationary, hands stationary. Or you can sense into, can I notice both? Can I notice the balance of stillness and movement? Stillness and movement. more important than noticing that right now. Taking a moment out of our lives just to notice what is it like when I can connect to the stillness of the body not moving and the movement of breath sound sensations Both are true. Both are happening. We can choose which place you put your attention.
Are you noticing movement? Are you noticing stillness? Are you lost in movement? Lost in stillness? I'm going to read the poem again. See if you can hear the stillness in it and the movement. And I think of Wynne and her wild ways, the year we had nothing to lose and lost it anyway in the cursed country of Bob. We still talk about that winter, how the cold froze imaginary buffalo on the stuffed horizons of snowbanks. The haunting voices of the starved and mutilated broken fences crashed our thermostat dreams and we couldn't stand it one more time. Once again, we lost a winter Stubborn memory. Walked through cheap apartment walls, skated through fields of ghosts into a town that never wanted us. In the epic search for grace. Like coyote, like rabbit, we could not contain our terror and clowned our way through a season of false midnights. We had to swallow that town with laughter so it would go down easy as honey. And one morning, as the sun struggled to break ice and our dreams had found us with coffee and pancakes in a truck stop along Highway 80, we found grace. I could say grace was a woman with time on her hands where a white buffalo escaped from memory. But in that dingy light, it was a promise of balance. We once again understood the talk of animals and spring was lean and hungry with the hope of children and corn. I would like to say with grace, we picked ourselves up and walked into the spring thaw. We didn't. The next season was worse. You went home to Leech Lake to work with the tribe, and I went south. And when, I'm still crazy. I know there is something larger than the memory of a dispossessed people. We have seen it. So tonight, I thought we'd talk a little bit about stillness and movement. Ajahn Chah, who's a famous Thai teacher, was known for a quote that he asked his monastics one time if they had ever seen still water. They're like, yeah, we've seen still water. So he asked him, have you ever seen flowing water? They're like, yeah, we've seen flowing water. So then he asked them if they've ever seen still flowing water. And I've thought about that a long time, still flowing water. 
And I think as those of us that do work on behalf of others or in the uh, in the struggle or in the in any way on the path, we have to learn what that still flowing water is. We have to learn what it feels like to know stillness and no movement at the same time. And I thought we'd talk about that. But I first want to see if anything came up for anyone that uh, we can kind of incorporate into this, this still flowing conversation. So if anything's up for anybody, you can raise your hand. I can see everybody, so you can just raise your hand and I can call on you. If not, I'll just do a little bit of my own talking for a little while. We're good? All right, so let's talk a little bit about still flowing. Why that's so important. So there's a way in the Western way that we talk about Buddha. I think sometimes we make him seem like he was like a loop out there away from the pain and suffering of the world, that he was somehow cloistered, taken care of, just like, uh, uh, just a step aside. So he doesn't really know what real pain is that we know. He didn't really see that. But I think that is just our Western colonialized mind. Because I think Buddha himself was in the thick of it. I think he was in the world that where pain and suffering lies. He was not in the world of Brahmins. In fact, many people tried to kill him because he was not in the world of Brahmins. And I don't know if Tara, did Tara, has Tara, Stacy, did Tara ever come and do a talk here? Tara Moulet? Well, Tara Moulet is this South Asian woman. She was in the teacher training program at IMS with me. And she gave a talk one time about how revolutionary Buddha was. And I can't do it justice, but whenever I have an opportunity to share this, I always share it. But something that she pointed out, pointed out in the Dhammapada is that the Buddha gave a talk one time and said something to the effect of someone who gives to the poor, someone who's kind, someone who's gentle, someone who does no harm. This is what I would consider a Brahmin. Someone who is, uh, you know, who practices renunciation, I consider them a Brahmin. And that may not seem very mind blowing, earth shattering. If you think of Brahmins as, you know, holy beings, you kind of expect that a Brahmin would be nice and kind. If they're kind of like sacred beings, then you'd expect that they would look after the poor, do all the nice things, sort of like the way we hold religious, pious people. They should be just doing the nice things normally. But what Tara said was that Brahmins were born into that. They didn't have to do nothing. They didn't have to lift a finger. They didn't have to help nobody. They were born into it. They were born holy, pious. And so what the Buddha was saying was that our actions set the comma of what we think of as Brahman. That's who he thought of as sacred and holy. And that was a revolutionary type statement. Which means that the Buddha was not, 
he was not very, I mean, he was acutely aware of things that were going on in the world around him. He spoke to both Dalit peoples and uh, Brahmins. So Dalits kind of like at the bottom of the caste and uh, Brahmins at the top. He talked to all of them. He, he talked to people who I know were working their butts off and weren't going nowhere. But I've always asked myself, why is it? I mean, I know life was hard where Buddha was because they lived, when he wandered through villages, they didn't live at people's houses. They slept on the charnel ground. So they slept where everybody died. They slept where the dead bodies are. I know for myself, I'm not sleeping where no dead bodies are. I'm gonna find some bed somewhere. I mean, I went to Europe is this the side? I went to Europe. I would have been in my, I probably early 50s or maybe 50, 51. So my probably about 10, 10 years or so ago. And I stayed at a hostel. Clearly that hostel is for the 20 year olds because it's not for the 50 year olds. And I swore. I'm not doing that no more. Next time I go, I don't care what it costs, I'm staying at a hotel. So for him to be who he was and staying at, living on charnel grounds and just living wherever he lived as he wandered around India, this is not someone who does not see what's going on in the world. It's not possible. So instead, I think we have to look at Buddha a little differently and look at the practice a little differently from the way that he's pointing. If we think of him as being in a kind of a cloistered world, then we can mistakenly think that my ordinary life is somehow substandard to the monastic life and that the monastic life is the life we should aim for. Oh, I need to do that kind of a life. That's a good life. I got to do this life because, you know, I, I, I can't do the monastic life. And our holy life becomes somehow or another secondary. It's, 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 it's the thing I do to keep me so I won't lose myself in my regular life, but it's not my life, life, life. My life, 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 that's when I'm, that's what I'm doing, that's the activeness I'm doing. That's my social justice, that's my working life, that's a, that's a real work. And my practice is something I do, you know, 20 minutes on the side, 30 minutes maybe today, maybe tomorrow on the side kind of like just keep me from losing it, but that's it. And I think what Buddha was actually pointing to is the opposite of that. I think the bulk of the people that he talked to were not monastics. The bulk of the people he was talking to, the bulk of the world he was talking around was to regular people who may or may not become monastics. That's what I think. I think he talked to regular people like you and me, struggling with life, trying to figure out what to do, how to hold it. And his wisdom was not pointed at be a monastic. There's a sutta where someone comes to the Buddha and says, you know, I like it when you talk about the monastics and everything and the holy life and that's all good. And I can see where they're going to get their, their liberation. But what about the rest of us? We like lying in the bed with lots of children, you know, eating good food. That's what they said. We like lying in the bed, eating good food with lots of children. So that means you're having a lot of sex, 
they're eating good food, they're rolling around, laziness. So what about us? What about us? And, and the Buddha never said something like, well, I think you need to get your life together and do some retreats. How much are you practicing? He didn't say anything like that. He just told them to pay attention to the company they keep. Pay attention to the precepts and live your life in alignment with the precepts and that that would bring good benefit to you. So you pay attention to the company you keep and you pay attention to the precepts, doing no harm, you know, not taking what's not freely given, things like that, things that we, that's just regular living our lives. But this is what I think the Buddha was pointing to that there's something to be said for accepting the life you're in and living within that life within the Dhamma, rather than kind of getting through the life you're in so that one day you can really practice, really, really practice. No, this is practice. This vigil has to be practice. If it's not practice, then we've missed something in what the Buddha was pointing to. So uh, you know the Buddha tried all kinds of things to get away from suffering. He tried blissful states of, you know, just the bliss, what we think of as jhanas. And he tried the aesthetics, neither one of them. What he ultimately decided, what he ultimately came to the place of was the middle way. And what I think that middle way is, a way to think about it is what Ajahn Chah was pointing to his monastics when he said, still flowing water. So what it means is that each of us have to find stillness within ourselves in a world that's moving. So we live in a world subject to the three characteristics, subject to impermanence, constant moving and changing, subject to that, and that it creates a dukkha. It creates that felt sense of irritation and rub. It creates attention. We can't avoid that. Monastics don't avoid it and we don't avoid it. We all are subject to the two arrows, two darts, whichever sutta you listen to. So the, it can't be that somehow we're gonna eventually get the world to be just right. we we'll finally get past all this suffering. No, this is the nature of the realm we live in, is suffering. That can sound kind of miserable if we're like, this is it. Don't be expecting something better because it's not getting better than this. Or you can begin to notice when you're meditating, what is it about being still and noticing movement that's so enticing, so pleasurable, so peaceful? That somehow if I, when I used to meditate in the beginning, I try to only be still. So I, I didn't want the anxiety. I didn't want any of the disruption. I didn't want the noise. I wanted to be quiet and still, quiet and still. That's what I was trying to get. And then other meditations I would have, it's all noise and anxiety and thinking and I'm drama field. I'm like, that's the bad. And then quiet and still, that's the good. But now having practiced for many, many years, the best meditations I think are the ones where I can feel that stillness and allow the movement to still be there. That I can somehow feel that I am just sitting here. I'm not doing anything. And yet I can hear the sound people talking, birds, planes. I can hear my own mind talking about stuff. 
I can feel sensations. There's all this movement and I'm not totally caught in the movement and I'm not totally turning away from it, trying to stay with the stillness. That somewhere in that balance, I have the ability to be with whatever arises. That's what I think the Buddha was pointing to. That's what I think he was pointing us towards is how balanced we are with our awareness of what's going on. Are you too caught up in the movement that you've lost your stillness? Or are you so caught up in your stillness that you can't even see there's movement going on here? And somehow or another, our learning to rest in the balance of that is what, um, is what I think he was pointing to. It's kind of uh, strange. I had a, a felt sense of this. I had to go get some parking permits. Um, so I, I decided to walk downtown in the heat. I'm just gonna walk, look for the shady parts. I'm gonna walk downtown, get some walk in, go get my permits. And I saw this young black guy I think he might be in his late 20s or early 30s. And I saw him uh, maybe a, about two blocks away. And I don't know if you guys know this, but Seattle has a serious homeless problem. I mean, I don't even know. I, I, I can't tell. I don't know why. We've always had a serious homeless problem. But we have many, 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 many homeless people. And this guy looked like he was not uh, like he had some mental health issues or something was amiss. And he had one shoe on and one shoe off. And uh, his clothes look a little tattered and he was just kind of talking and doing things that would lead you to believe that he's not, he's like having some mental, he has mental uh, health issues. That's why he's sort of on the streets. And I was watching as people kind of walk to the side of him. You know, they were walking and, and then they would get close to him and then they'd take this wide kind of go around so they wouldn't have any contact with him. And I'm telling myself, okay, to him. We're not, he's not dangerous. We're just gonna walk straight ahead, walk straight ahead. And I heard him talking the closer I got and then I heard him start crying. And I kept walking. I heard him crying. I kept walking, kept walking, kept walking right past him. Maybe when I got about a block away is when it hit me. The felt sense of walking past him and not doing something. I got to fix that because He's crying. He looks like my kids' age. And he's crying. And he looks like he needs some help. And there's just all this stuff started coming into my mind. So I called my son, who works a lot with homeless people. And I called him. And I'm like, I can't take it. I can't. I, I'm having a hard time here. I should have did something. I should have said something. And he said, no, you shouldn't have said something. You can't always say something. You can't always do something because you don't know what, what his state of mind is. He looked like, like if, you, if you're not skilled with working with people, who are mental, you can do more damage trying to uh, engage with them when they're afraid. And it, it looked like he was afraid. That's what it looked like to me. But the crying is what got me. He's starting to cry. And then I felt like I should do something. I should reassure him. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm okay. Do something. So Raymond kind of talks me off the ledge. And then he goes, 
this is the reason why I want to say this is because he said, Mama, I think you should focus more on the fact that you can feel the pain of this because so many people will walk right by him and never feel a thing. That the, the, the problem is not the, for homeless people, it's the deadness of the world around them. That they, we don't, that people just completely are dead to the whole uh, situation. And that the fact that you can feel and you're willing to feel you're gonna to have to start appreciating that more than you do. And I just was shocked he said that. You know, I thought he was gonna say, well, you should get this service and that service and this service and that, because that's what he does. But he said that the biggest problem that they have with homeless people is the felt sense of being unimportant, dead, nobody cares, and you just walk right by and you don't even, you don't even feel anything. You just walk, like walk right around and don't say anything. So I thanked him. He got off the phone. And sort of like what Joy Harjo was saying, I wish I could tell you I felt better after that. Like I got all bucked up. I'm like, good. Okay, I did it. It's okay. You're okay. The reason why I'm telling you this is because I have felt sad ever since. Like that sadness didn't go away because Raymond said, it's okay, you didn't say anything, you didn't do anything. And that somehow or another, my practice is not, can't be, it's not about making that sadness go away. It is about learning how to hold that sadness because that sadness was true. I don't have to make it go away. I have to just let it be a part of the world I am in and still know that I know grace because I have seen it. So there's a way in which the, the thing that I realized was when I was gonna come and talk to you is that this vigil is sort of like that. You know, you could come on the vigil and you could say, okay, eventually we're gonna get everything all cleared up and we're gonna finally settle everything out. Everything's gonna get righteous and we shut down the vigil and everything's okay. Woo, we got past that. But sort of like Stacy said, you know, it's, it's, it's the same old, same old. But somehow we have to hold that, both the pain of it the grace of it, this wanting or chanda aspiration for it to be different, we have to hold all of that in stillness. And the stillness isn't coming from outside of us. It's coming from in here. Our willingness to be with dukkha, our willingness to be with impermanence, and our willingness to accept the non-self of it, the emptiness of it, the inability to impact the world in such a way that we fix things. Somehow we have to learn to live as practitioners with that. And I believe over the years, Many, 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 many monastics have felt the pain of the societies going on around them. You can't go on alms round and get only leaves and rice and not feel the poverty of the people who's giving you food. You can't do it. You feel it. You can't go on alms round and not feel the despair of people who have lost their children or lost their parents, or lost their brother. We can't, you know, go on arms rounds and not feel the suffering of the people that are feeding you. And for the Buddha to require 
his monastics to go on alms rounds. He was saying, I think you have to go and feel what's happening in the world. And you have to find the balance of being with that and holding your stillness at the same time. So that's what we practice. I think that's what we're practicing for is to be able to do that, to be able to be still and still be in the world with movement. I think that's probably where I want to stop. Yeah. Thank you so much for your kind attention. We'll just take a moment to gather ourselves, see what words work for us and which words don't work so much for us. So maybe we can talk a little bit about how you're doing and if you have any questions, it's whatever comes up for you. We got some time to see where you're at, see how you're doing in this weariness, how much longer you can hold on to this vigil, hold on to the sketchiness of what you're doing. And it doesn't have to go away. You don't have to somehow get it all fixed up. You know, we, I think part of this is television, you know, because we grew up in a world of television and television, it's like sitcoms. All the cop shows I watch, you know, they figure out the bad guys and they get it all tightly wound up and they saw the save the day. I mean, we hate it when it's a to be continued and you got to wait a week before you see the ending. Well, we don't really do that anymore because now it's like watch it all day. You know? So, But back when I was growing up, I learned life as a 30 minute sitcom, hour long show, you know, and everything's all tight. Everything's all fixed and tidied up. Got to get it all tidied up in an hour. And I think in our minds, that's the way we think it ought to be. Somehow we got to know exactly how to do it, tidy it up, get it all fixed, and then we're good. But really, the world is such that it's all a mystery and we don't know. There's no tidying it up. We got to live with brokenness and live with it forever. We got to live with dukkha forever and somehow our steadiness is what allows for that not the fixing of dukkha changing the condition so i don't have to feel the dukkha but the steadiness inside helps us have the capacity to be in a world a realm of all dukkha And grace. That's right. We don't want to forget that. We've seen it. Yeah, it took me a long time to come to an understanding that holding another's pain mm. is as significant as fixing it. Mm -hmm. Because I, oftentimes, if I don't, I, my sons and I, I have two boys, we would fight because I am trying my best to fix their lives. I'm trying my best. I'm doing everything I can to fix it. And my youngest son really, really brought that home for me one time. Mm. I, uh, I wanted him to go to college like his older brother did. 
but he's a musician and he wants to play music. So he can do the dishwashing thing as long as it pays the rent. He's good. But I am like, no, no, no. You got to go to college. You got to get your career. And it's not music. That's not paying the bills. <laughs> and then one day, I mean, we used to fight. I'm, 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 we used to fight. I'm just telling you, ugly fights. And one day he came to me and he asked me if I remember that picture of him when he was like in Head Start and he had the blue shirt on. And I'm like, oh, this is, that's my baby. I remember that picture. You were so cute. He goes, I'm not that kid. And I'm like, well, I mean, you are, you're just older. He goes, no, I'm not that kid. Now I'll go to school and, and, or I'll be happy and I'll do whichever one you want, but I'm not the kid you think I am. It was like such a hard thing for me to hear that he is not that cute little kid with the blue shirt. And that's why, that's who I see when I see him. That's who I see. And he was basically saying, you gotta, you gotta get that. I'm a grown man. I'm gonna do my own life. Now do what you want, but I wouldn't necessarily be happy. So would you, which, which one should we do? I'm like, well, I want you to be happy. He goes, okay. Then you're gonna have a kid that doesn't go to college. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I cannot hold that. But that's what I ended up having to hold. That's what I have to hold is this wanting one thing that doesn't, it's not gonna happen. And can I be okay with that? That's a hard thing for us to hold in the world is that we cannot fix everything. We have to learn that some things, the only thing we can do is hold it. That's it. That's what I think about this vigil. That's what you're doing. I mean, I'm sure you have your own ideas of how you wish things were, but the only thing you know you can do is as a Sangha, come together and hold something. And I think that's what he, I think that's what I'm pointing to on the, the stillness and movement because mm -hmm. he's not trying to fix the fact that she's lost everyone. You know, it's like, he, he, it, we're, we're not trying to fix the harm that's actually happened. The pain, the thing that's prompting the suffering. It's more of, we have to learn that our stillness our capacity, our ability to be in this realm is going to come from our internal practice and not the external changing of circumstances. Just imagine this. Imagine that we could end racism. We could end it right now. We could figure it out. We could come up with the right policy that spoke to racism and we could end it. Do you think it would come back? Because if you don't think it'll come back, we got a problem. It's impermanent. So even our solutions are subject to change, dukkha, and emptiness. So this idea that we can somehow come up with the solution that's gonna make it all right, to me is a misunderstanding of the realm we're living in. What we, in the realm we're living in as practitioners, is pretty much what Patrice is pointing to and uh, Irma, is it Irma? Irma is pointing to, it is more about learning how to be in the midst of suffering and not get swallowed up. That somehow that strength right there is where liberation lies, not in the end of racism or end of homelessness, 
or I hear people talking about the end of social injustice, the end of it. And that, yeah, I always say, okay, well, let's say we did that. We do live in Dukkha, so you do know it's coming right back. I've had the end of anxiety and it came right back. I've had the end of disappointment and anger, but it came right back. So it's not like as long as I'm alive, there's not going to be some degree of harm to another that we have to learn to hold. But there's something in it, learning to hold it, that I think is more important. I don't think what you're saying is too harsh or too sensitive. I think what you're saying is you're speaking to the level of pain that is existing, right? So I can talk about racism isn't going to end, but it does have some painful experience and expressions of it. What I'm pointing to is this. What I think my son was pointing to, what I think the point is, my image of Thaddeus is the five-year-old. That is no longer true, but that's who I see. And that's who I want. I want that. I want this image of what I think the world should be. What I think Buddha was trying to point to is not our imagination of what suffering is, because it is very difficult to bear that if it's all just our imagination. But it is this ability to be in the truth of it. So if you're feeling the truth of the brown bodies that are being harmed, you can get caught up in the imagery of it, which is the wind, which is the movement, and that can entangle you. You could turn away completely towards the stillness and not even deal with it. What I think the Buddha was pointing to is that if you have the capacity to find your own inner stillness, then the appropriate response, which is compassion. It is the heart's movement in the midst of suffering. Then the appropriate response arises out of that stillness. So it's not like you're not going to do anything. I think that's what Patrice was pointing to. It's not like you're not going to do anything because you don't have to turn away from it. You can both hold the pain of it and respond within it. But we get overwhelmed by it because we want it to go away. We want it to be fixed, right, no more wrong. But that is asking more of the world than is actually true in the world. Right. Privilege. We talk a lot about the pain of oppression but I'm hoping that one day we start talking about the pain of privilege because that privilege is not such a good place to be in. I kind of am, not kind of, I'm glad I was born black because the weight of privilege for being born white is I, I don't even, I can't bear it. I can barely bear the privilege of being an English speaker or being someone that does not have a Spanish accent, because if I had a Spanish accent, once I start talking, I'm subject to all this racism. Or being in a world where I went all the way to law school and I know people who um, can't read. I mean, th there is the privilege of education, of being an English speaker. I mean, there's just so many privileges out there that I just take for granted. But the weight of it is difficult. So what you are holding, what I think you have to hold, Jessica, the pain of is that you cannot fix what your privilege allows you to see. You cannot fix it. And you want to, 
Beethoven was like the master of unresolved. He would write music where you're, the tension between the violins are killing you and you really want that, get to the major chord, get out of that dissonance and get in that major chord. And he ventured, it's like when you couldn't take it anymore, he would resolve and you could feel it in your whole body. That's what I'm, I think you're pointing to is that in some respects in your practice, you have to be willing to hold that I cannot right the wrong of privilege, that really it is something I am destined to bear. And you can do what you can when circumstances give way for you to do whatever you can to help, but you will not be able to ever right you will not be able to wipe away the weight of white privilege. It is just a weight that has to be bared. And if you bear it, because it's painful, and you can, I think for most of us that do, that are in the struggle, you can tell who's bearing their white privilege and who's not. Because the ones that are bearing it, they can kind of talk to you. The ones that aren't, they, you know, it's like glassed over, don't see nothing. So you gotta, you, you do have to, it is a heavy burden to bear, but it's a heavy burden for black people to bear oppression. And so yeah. we're all bearing something that's very heavy, yeah. but that's our, that's our job. Well, I wanna leave you with something. There are, there are, there are discourses in the suttas that are inspiring to me. If you've never read any suttas, you got to go on Access the Insight and put in a search word. Just stick in a word like freedom. I don't care. And then look at those suttas. Some of them, they're not going to make any sense. They're going to seem dry and like, oh, my God, I just don't know if I can read any of this. But some of them will stir your heart. And I want to leave you with one that stirs my heart every time I think about it. Buddha was sitting in this uh, Jetta's Grove, which is like a monastery uh, that he would go to during the rainy seasons. And so he's sitting in this place late at night. Um, I would say, you know, it's like three, four o'clock in the morning. And he's sitting there meditating, not in our time, it's pitch black out there. You can't see nothing. And he's sitting there and this deva comes to him that has such radiance that she lights up the entire Jeddah's Grove. That's how radiant she is. And she goes to the Buddha and she asked him, how is it venerable sir? that you cross the floods. This floods, meaning the, the, the world we live in, this impactful world that sucks us up and all of a sudden we're yelling at people. I don't even know where that came from. All of a sudden I'm losing it. How did you cross the floods? And he goes, I crossed the floods by not pushing forward and not standing still. Okay, she's like, uh, Okay, not sure I know what that means. So she asked him again, well, okay, how did you not push forward and not stand still? He said, when he pushed forward, he got entangled. And when he stood still, he sank. So he crossed the floods by not pushing forward and not standing still. And I think she then understood what he meant. What I think he meant was, it's in this balance of not shoving our way into the world, trying to result, 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 get the results the way we want them, pushing forward, gotta be like this. That's just gonna entangle us into more drama, more hindrances, more drama, more drama, dukkha. 
And if we just stand still and don't do nothing, we're just going to sink. It's just going to wash over us. So instead, we are learning this balanced way of moving in the world that's not pushing forward and it's not standing still. And somehow, we're both still moving water. That's what we're learning. And we learn it little bit by little bit, watching, paying attention, it's like that. So just whenever you're like struggling, you got to think to yourself, we live in the realm where awakening is possible. So we live in, in the human realm where awakening is possible. But that deva lives in a godly realm. So she lives in a realm where it's all bliss, all beautiful, all wonderful. How come she's going down talking to the Buddha, asking him at the late night hour, how'd you do that? There is something that the Buddha came to and we can't always connect to it with just everybody. But we, that's why we get together with Sangha, we get together with Sangha and we talk on these things so that we encourage each other on how to be with this dukkha, this difficult realm that we're living in. All right, so that's what, that's what, that's what our charge is. That's what we're doing. And uh, you just keep holding your vigil and you keep holding it down. You keep showing up, spending time may not seem like you're changing anything, but you're changing the hearts of everybody on the Zoom call. You're making it so we can all do this together. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great stories and wisdom. Thank you. We are so grateful to have had you here this evening and Me too. Uh, it is because of the generosity of people like all of you here on this call that allows us to host Tawari this evening so um, offer an opportunity to not only support Tawari's livelihood so she can continue teaching and sharing her great deep wisdom but also um, so that others ahead of us may may get these teachings. So Gabe has placed a, ch a link in the chat to the Common Ground Meditation website. Um, and two thirds of your offerings today will go to Tuary and Common Ground retains a third for operations as we are slowly opening our doors and have in-person opportunity for in-person <laughs> teaching. So, mm. Deep, deep gratitude and much love to you, Tawari. So happy to be here with you. Thank I know, you so I was so happy. Everyone. So nice. <laughs> <laughs>